I want you to call your mind back to this. Uh, do you remember we went outside and we had a go with this thing and um, off that we started to think about how this would connect to calculus and the kinds of insights we could gain from it, right? So just to revise, what we did was we came up with a displacement equation. We guessed at one based on the sort of flight path of the ball and how it went with respect to time. Morning. Then we, we looked at this and we, we recognized it looked like a parabola. It, when you when you consider it over time, it looked like a concave down parabola. So off that, we differentiated to get a velocity function, right? So that's um, dx on dt, and you can call it v if you like because velocity, right? And then we went one more time to think about acceleration. Um, which, by the way, we, I drew your attention to the fact that the units for these are it is one length unit, one, um, one distance here, and there's two time units, which is why you get meters per second per second, right? Alternatively, even though I wouldn't exactly recommend it, you could write this, I suppose, like this. I mean, that's the way we write meters per second per second. And S and U is an index of minus two, right? But anyway, we could also indicate that by just calling it A for acceleration. Right. Now, that was the way we went in that order. We, we started from displacement, differentiated to get to velocity, and then we differentiated again to get to acceleration. But then you might have noticed, if you remember, uh, we ended up with a problem. Because we basically made up this equation, <laughs> right? what we ended up getting to at the bottom actually wasn't, it didn't gel with reality, because we got a number there. Do you remember what it was? I think it was something like negative three. Something like that, okay? Now, we knew it was negative, that was good because the ball dropped down to the ground. But we knew that this number was wrong because we know what this number is supposed to be. It represents something we're familiar with, namely gravity, right. So gravity is not negative three. Uh, we have an approximation for gravity and that's gonna be our starting point for today. Uh, because the point is that you don't necessarily have to go downward, differentiate through your motion equations. You can go in the other direction because we know how to do that so long as you have enough information. Okay, so make a little subheading, which is starting with gravity. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Instead of conjuring up a displacement equation, right, and then climbing down the ladder, we're going to start with something we can empirically um, confirm, which is we actually know what the force of gravity is, okay? Now, questions should be nice, and they should say, assume, and then they'll talk about the force of gravity, right? And you either, there's sort of two main classes. Um, there's going to be, sorry, I take that back, there's three. Sometimes they'll just say, call it G. All right, uh, and so you'll just have that letter floating around in your equations. It's a constant; you don't really have to worry about it. Alternatively, they'll give you one of two values for g. Okay, the common ones are ten, as in ten meters per second per second, or the other one's nine point eight. Okay, nine point eight's a bit more um, it's a bit more accurate. So I'm going to go with that. Okay, now they're going to assume that's the acceleration. Uh, with relation to gravity, but of course it's going downward, right? Now, they'll often say it like this, and they won't tell you which way to go. The reason why they're doing that is because they're giving you flexibility as to choose whether x positive is up or x positive is down, okay? And depending on which direction you choose for the question, that'll determine the direction that gravity is going in, okay? So for now, let's just go with gravity being negative, okay? So I can say, therefore, um, neglecting air resistance, not thinking about the fact that the bigger this object is, that affects its acceleration and velocity and so on. Okay. I can say the only thing that's accelerating this object one way or another morning, is gravity. That's all. Okay. So I can say x double dot, right? our acceleration, I'm going to say it's negative 9.8. So I'm considering x positive as up. That makes gravity go down. Common sense. Okay, from there, since I'm starting here, if I want to go upwards and know things about velocity and displacement, I need to integrate, right? So I could say, integrating, I get x dot, and think about this, I'm, I'm integrating with respect to, well, these are all functions of time, aren't they? Right, you can tell by the, you can tell by the t's. 
okay? Uh, we can express them in terms of other things, but we'll get onto that later. If I integrate with respect to time, and this is what I'm starting with, what will I get for my velocity equation? I have my minus 9.8, and it'll just be multiplied by t, one lot of it. Okay? That's good, but there's something else I have to account for. This is an indefinite integral. I'm going to boundaries, right? So I need a constant. Okay. Now, I'm actually going to call it, because I know I'm going to get another one in a second, I'm going to call it constant 1, because I don't want to have two c's floating around that are actually equal to different things. Okay. Now, I can integrate one more time to get to a displacement equation. Now the interesting thing about this, once I, oh, no dots, just x, right? The interesting thing about this is once I get to this result, these three equations, these three motion equations, will tell me what happens all the time when your only acceleration is due to gravity. All the time, no matter how you start. And you'll see why in a second, okay? So let's integrate. Negative 9.8 is gonna turn into negative 4.9. Right? Because the power has gone up by 1 and then you have to divide by the power. Okay? So you're going to get very familiar with seeing these over and over again because they always come up when you have gravity. Right? Okay, you've got a constant flying off on the end, so you're going to get a t along with here. And then of course, because we've integrated a second time, you have a second constant. Okay, there you go. So, Generally speaking, these are the three equations that you get and you always get if you start with gravity. Okay? So you can put in different kinds of conditions into this to start to evaluate your constants. And we usually evaluate them as we go. Okay? So let's go and think back about the tennis ball. Okay? So a little sub-example. Okay. We'll come back to this idea. Right? Now, if we start with gravity, Right? Um, I'm going to go here. This is my starting point. Okay? So I integrate up once. But I actually know some things about how, uh, what we did with the test ball. Right? So for instance, I, I, mean, I threw it straight up in the air. Okay? Now, in order to work out this constant, to evaluate it, okay, I need some condition between time and x dot, velocity, right? So in other words, I need to know at some point in time how fast was the ball going. Does that make sense? I need to know, for some value of t, I need to know a velocity. So you've got some choices, okay? Um, the most common one is you'll get an initial condition, okay? So suppose an initial condition. Now initial, obviously, it, it implies t equals zero, right? What do you think might be a reasonable guess for how hard I threw the ball? Hmm. If I throw a ball, how far is it going to travel in, say, you know, one second? This is hard. I, I mean, it's hard to measure because it all happens pretty quickly. Um, I'm going to say, for instance, 15 meters a second upward. I don't think that's unusual. 15 meters is actually not that far, and a ball can travel pretty fast in 15 meters. Later on, we'll be able to test, just like we did here, you know, this is wrong. We'll be able to test out the um, accuracy of these numbers in a second because we'll see what we get for displacement and station points and so on, okay? So let's just give that a go. If that's true, I can sub that in here, right? So I can say um, when t equals zero, x dot should equal 15, right? That makes sense. So I sub it in the way that I usually do. I'll get 15 over here, minus 9.8 times 0, plus my constant. And of course, as you'd expect, right, and as will happen again, your time terms just disappear and you're just left with the constant. So you'll get used to that constant simply being equal to your initial condition, which I suppose would correspond to the fact that this is, you know, y equals mx plus b type thing. This is the um, y-intercept. That's your initial condition. Okay, great. Now I have a velocity equation. I'll integrate again to give me a displacement equation, which gives me this. Uh, whoops, sorry. Yeah. 
And again, I'll need some kind of value, some kind of point in time, and a displacement that I know so that I can actually evaluate this constant. Okay. Now, let's actually push on this a little bit. Before we had a bit of a simplified model, and we called my hand the origin, and I, I caught the ball. Okay. Let's just make things a little more interesting. Um, suppose I threw the ball up from that position, but I didn't catch it. That's a more interesting kind of situation to deal with. Okay. So therefore, when time equals zero, you know, suppose an initial condition. I've got a couple of choices, right? I could keep on calling my hand the origin, right? That would mean when it hits the ground, what would that mean about displacement? It would be negative because it's below my hand, okay? Alternatively, I could call something else the origin. What else might we choose? I could choose the ground as the origin, which would be at time zero, where is the ball? I mean, well, however high it is, right? Now, let's see, I actually have a rule here, don't I? So, that's not a bad starting point. Why don't we call it a meter? That's kind of convenient, okay? So now I have, when time equals zero, um, suppose an initial condition of um, one meter above the ground. That's where I throw the ball from, okay? So I'm going to get this kind of statement again. When t equals zero, um, x displacement equals one. You can see what's going to happen. The same kind of thing, because it's an initial condition, this time term and this time term will disappear. So you can say that constant hanging off on the end, that's going to be equal to one. So now I have my displacement equation. Okay, cool. Now, why don't we test this out and see how reasonable it was, okay? Um, I want to get you in a few minutes, uh, in a few seconds, to draw this and to pose some questions to it, okay? So here's what I want you to draw. And I'm not going to tell you what questions to pose to it. I just want you to think, what can I gain from this? What kind of useful uh, information can I interpret off this once I graph it? Okay. So make your scale sort of decent so you can see things. Um, you're going to have some weird decimals in there. Maybe you need to solve so you can actually get some values in here. They're awkward numbers, but that's okay. You can still work with them with the quadratic formula. Give that a go.